Shake my hand, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our final lecture on the 1980s People's Power. Um, you know, I want to say thank you so much once again for listening in. Thank you so much for engaging. Um, and if you watch this uh, uh, particular video on time, I am told this Thursday there will be a consultation or is it a tutorial? And I will be live with Ms. Mokwetu, so feel free to log in and ask all your questions. I'm looking forward to engaging with you guys. Um, I really enjoyed, you know, my, my limited time with you, walking you through the 1980s People's Power. And I hope that you've also kind of like enjoyed, um, you know, listening to what I have to say and kind of currently engaging with your readings, right? So maybe before I wrap up, I just want to do a bigger, broad review or recap of everything that we've covered so far, all right? So you remember, right, on, off the bit, we started off by agreeing that you guys are readers, leaders are readers, and especially historians. Um, the, 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 the hope and the, the faith of humanity for the future is really in your hands as historians. So I really hope that you guys are reading your readings. We learned that there was always been dialectical, historical transition in South Africa, both within South Africa, but also in the global context, and also really, you know, in this historical long-term pattern of struggle, right? And, 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 and then we talked about patriotic history and the literature and why this particular direction we took in the people's power of making sure we give it its place, making sure that we really highlight it for what it was, its organs, its grassroots, uh, levels, its ideas and ideals, you know, set out very clearly what it aimed to do, uh, you know, a, 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 as a as a community based project, right? Um, um, outside of heroism and, and other things that were led later later on, you know, read into history. And by the way, it's not necessarily criticism, but just some that I want everyone to be aware of. You know, there are these massive volumes, about six, seven, or even eight volumes. I forget when I read them. Are uh, called the road to democracy, and, and, and that's the type of incredible rich history in there. Um, there's so much to learn if you could go through the, that incredible series. But also, now that you know what we've talked about, about the 1980s People's Movement, I'm hoping you'll be able to go through volumes of information like that with a clearer lens to be able to kind of like go, okay, this is patriotic history. This is what really happened, et cetera, et cetera. We covered, you know, the aim of the people's power, right? What they were aiming for, right? The creation of these new bottom-up forms of governance outside and against the state. Ultimately, uh, uh, you know, trying to pre-configure a specific type of society, which I think by now we can all agree to was not what we got in the transition, in the, in the compromise era, right? Which is... Uh, uh, some interesting stuff you're going to be dealing with next week, right? Um, um, we also looked at liberation versus democracy, and then we basically laid a foundation about what led to the 1980s revolution. We looked at the structural approach of things. We looked at the 1970s that set the scene, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we got into a couple of specific examples about the 1980s themselves. We looked at, um, you know, the civil gang. We looked at the Transvaal. We looked at, uh, uh, you know, the Cradle Kitchen Committee right here in the Eastern Cape. We, we we really tried to nitpick, you know, different types of examples. Then we looked at different types of organs of power. We looked at the, the uh, uh, you know, the, the people's uh, school. The People's Krish, we looked at um, a, a women's organization group, we looked at the people's courts, we, we looked at the street committees, we looked at the civic committees, we looked at uh, um, so, some, some clergy church committees, and we just tried to kind of like really like give out different examples from across the country at the same time. But while I was doing this, I hope Oh, you, you notice that all of it was based on this massive national, you know, movement. Millions and millions of people took this call, right? And so we really started to nitpick that 1980s period, uh, you know, you know, from apartheid to uh, uh, people's power. And we spoke a lot in detail about that kind of stuff. And then we looked at, you know, in greater detail what they aimed to achieve, you know, how how a lot of their ideals were linked to other areas like the Saktu era where you could see the working class in the 1980s clinging onto the Freedom Charter, the people shall govern, taking that call quite literally 
build in structures to do just exactly that. We spoke about what those structures looked like and kind of like how they they, they operated at the time. Um, um, and then we spoke about, you know, in, in our last lecture, we started to look at, okay, what was the role then of the ANC, the exalt ANC, the exalt MK? What did they want to do with it? And I'm going to be diving into a bit more of that today in our final last lecture um, as we finally put an end to this uh, three-part lecture series, which I actually hope you've enjoyed. And if you have, uh, 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 um, yeah, just find a way to reach out, maybe leave a comment on the videos uh, or let Ms. McQuaid know especially if you've got any questions, uh, I'm always looking to, to, to hear from you and, and engage with you. Okay, right, so in this particular uh, uh, part here, I really want to focus on, on, on a couple of things. Number one, I don't want us to leave with the romanticized idea of the 1980s. It had its own problems, like 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 all things really. It had its own problems. And I really want to kind of like, you know, point out a couple of those today. Right. So we are wrapping up. So I think it's important, important right off uh, at the beginning to point out a few things that kind of like give a characterization of sorts, just in case. I have not yet been clear. I feel like I've tried to hint at these things, but I just want to really paint this picture with very broad strokes, right? The leaders of the civic associations consisted basically of the youth, right? The 1980s people movement is a movement heavily leaned on by women. It is led by women. There are a lot of women involved. The community is very much involved. When I say community, I mean everyone. There is uh, influence from the unions. Workers are involved. Uh, it's when we're talking about, you know, workerism, Posato, et cetera, all those ideas are there. And then on the ground as well is the youth, all right? The youth was such a big, 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 big um, 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 figure in this people's power thing, right? So so the youth who sometimes would impose their will onto others, right? So, so this became a thing, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it became slightly difficult, uh, I'll put it that way, to sometimes control the different structures with all these youths doing different things. Um, um, and, and, and you'll see what I mean as we get on with different examples today. But this basically meant um, 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 there was a lack of control in the type of violence that occurred outside the counter power violence against the state, if, if you know, if, if that makes sense, right? Though so there were tensions as well between civics and unions, right? In part because the unions specifically wanted to ensure their own autonomy and were wary of undemocratic practices in UDF affiliated bodies, right? So, so that later on becomes a very big issue. Remember, we spoke about the type of organic, uh, a grassroots democracy type structures that we saw were really there. We saw that they were really creating these people power moments. Uh, uh, what, what I'm referring to here is later on the continuous development of these things and how, you know, it started to create problems, you know. And, and the ANC, number three, also exercised a growing influence behind the scenes from about 1986-ish, uh, uh, you know, when ANC militants were uh, 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 starting to infiltrate people's power organs starting to want to control people's power organs for their tactics and their strategies, leaning towards a people's war, which really was paving way for an armed struggle, right? An armed uh, liberation struggle, right? So ANC militants were often extremely, um, and this is not new within within our struggle history, right? Within the left, like there's a lot of intolerance. Right? So, ANC militants were often intolerant of non-ANC voices, right? So obviously there's a lot of internal fighting that's starting to happen. And you remember in our very first lecture, we spoke about being careful, being careful in any type of analysis being put forward by the 1980s, that there was any type of homogeneity, right? That there was any type of even approach to these things, right? All these programs, all these movements had uneven developments uh, 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 in reaction to an uneven, you know, capitalist developmental environment, in reaction to, you know, different things on the ground, right? It was never 
one mind for all type of thing. So please, please just always bear that in mind. Now, however, the period of mass self-organization in the 1980s, despite all of this, showed the possibilities of the people's will, right, to self-organize and to self-rule from below that it was absolutely possible, right? This was a very, very, very big thing. You know, if, if you really think about it, you know, for me, you know, th this 1980s period will always illustrate the potential for cooperation between trade unions, because there was a lot of it, community-based organizations, and other types of youth and cultural sports at unprecedented levels of solidarity. I mean, when these guys agreed to do something and they did it, you know, at a massive scale. It showed mutual help projects with created spaces full of solidarity, communal support, whether the likes of the soup kitchens, the swin collectives, the community crashes, the anti-crime patrols, the defense units, the people's courts. I can go on and on and on, right? So I, I want us to be very much aware of the criticisms, but I'm not taking anything away, you know, from the fact that it did show and really illustrate a real example that things can actually occur, you know, the, the, the opposite way. I say opposite because we're used to a top-down approach, right? The opposite meaning ground up, right? Which is a far much more better approach, right? Now, the radical interpretation of democracy deserves special attention. What was their idea of democracy in the 1980s? Uh, in the 1980s, democratic practices like mass meetings, the accountability of leaders and committees were very important. And people also saw democracy uh, very much linked to value to their struggles. So, so, so the way they struggled, right? The way they, they, they organized themselves was actually a way of expression, a specific type of democracy that they wanted to inherit in the tomorrow they were fighting for, all right? Uh, you know, today, many of the principles of self-organization of the 1980s and the very culture of radical participatory and direct democracy, and remember by that I mean, I think I gave the example that you, you, you would have to be extremely committed to this type of uh, program. Uh, um, um, so, so, so just think about the townships, which is not something difficult to imagine. Uh, you know, we always tell people that apartheid might be over, but class apartheid still exists. Uh, geographical apartheid still exists. We still have the, pretty much the same townships, you know, that, that we inherited from there. And you would know, right, that, you know, in a normal township, in a, in a small yard, they can be anywhere between six to eight people. And, and, and I'm bringing this up not only because it's, it's our lived realities, but it's actually a very important point to, to, to make when demonstrating this culture of radical participatory and direct democracy. Within a yard, there would be between eight to ten people as a, a Moses... Mikey, so I think is how you pronounce the surname, actually mentions, right? And, and, and those 10 to 8 people within that particular yard would automatically be part of a yard committee that deals with the issues in their yard. The yard committee is automatically linked to the street committee. The yard is on a specific street. That street has a committee. The street committee has a representative that then represents the yard committee, street committee in our block committee, right? And these people would have weekly meetings, weekly meetings to ensure that the stuff is going according to plan. It could be about protests. It could be about organizing soup kitchens. It could be about going to create defensive units for this particular street because the police are raiding consistently. It could be potentially about going to uh, ensure that the boycotts uh, down the road are maintained, etc. Right, with this obligatory, obligatory, and absolutely accountability system of community leaders. Right, there was a, a, a special love for long and open meetings, and these were continued and shared by some contemporary social movements in South Africa today. So, I think that is the legacy of the 1980s. When many people believe that democracy is not this abstract idea where we vote once every five years, but rather a tool and a practice, all right, which must be used by the whole community uh, 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 on a continuous basis. Okay? And, and I think that, uh, that for me is how I would interpret their interpretation 
of what real democracy was, okay? Now, unions and townships, remember, I did apologize in our previous lecture that, you know, due to uh, a limited time, I really wish I could spend time really unpacking this, spend time, you know, really breaking down the UDF, spend time really, really linking, you know, the predecessors of, uh, not predecessors, but like uh, the Fosatu era, because Fosatu started in 1979, right? Really shaping these big ideas that exist, all right? Because remember, ideas absolutely matter because ideas generally shape the struggle they shape the way you're gonna fight they shape what you're gonna fight for and so understanding the ideas of a lot of these moments in history these movements generally gives us a better perception of what it is they're aiming for right so now before udf right and arguably as a prerequisite the unions and township street committees made the idea of UDF possible. The United Democratic Front was this very big umbrella. But before it happened, I mean, I, I really truly believe and I'd argue that it, 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 it existed and its very existence is a testimony to, 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 to the pre-already existing ideas of this people's powers, of this mass mobilization of this idea of, of, of really taking control and creating organs of power you know that can fight against and fight for the working class right so by the mid 1970s after the massive and famous uh 1973 durban strikes there there, there was an independent trade union movement on the ground already gaining serious strength right gaining serious you know, you know, traction. We, we like to say unions were starting to once again flex their incredible, you, you know, uh, uh, muscles. And you remember the, the, the 70s, we already spoken, you know, a little bit in detail about that, how repressive that era was, all the different things that took place, including black consciousness, right? Now, in the 70s, you had the mass strikes, okay? You had factory struggles, Right, uh, that took place in the country, you know, where workers established democratic control of their unions and created strike committees, right? More committees on top of committees. Remember, if you're in a strike committee for your union, you're also representing your street committee where you stay within your yard or block committee, right? The spread of the democratic culture and organizing approach of these unions, especially for Satu, uh, which was formed in about 1979, played a major role in mobilizing ordinary people and enabling the development of so-called organs of people outside, you know, in the workplace. Secondly, the townships were, since the late 1970s, ha you know, have always been, you know, for, for, for the longest of time, the center of socioeconomic decline. Remember, we're talking about that structural approach in lecture one, right? So, 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 so everything, everything bad, if you ever needed apartheid in a microcosm where you could hold it in a globe with all its evil, with all its terrible things, the economic crisis, the terrible housing, the, 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 the segregation, the, 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 the racial divide, all of that is perfectly embedded, unfortunately, in the townships. So the townships have always been this center of social socioeconomic decline in the context of the capitalist crisis. And this is where and why I believe we saw the emergency of new organizations in response to that, right? Creating new forms of committees, street committees, et cetera, et cetera, civic associations uh, 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 to kind of like deal with that particular problem. You don't know this, but I'm gonna have a quick sip of water. Right, I thank you, right. so. Now, while trade unions raise issues around wages, transport, racist treatment at work, and, and other structural issues in the workplace, the new community structure's task was to fight for everyday social needs of the residents, right, at the same time, right? So they would focus on decent housing for the same worker at work who's fighting for better wages. They would focus on low rents, for the same workers and community people around them for who are fighting against racist treatment and transport, electricity, against evictions, so forth and so forth. As with the unions, these struggles raise larger issues around the distribution of wealth and power. And this is so important. We, we, we did touch on this in lecture one, that, that, that 
the more you struggle, militant struggle will naturally force you into politics. It will naturally push you into an evolution of conscientization, right? Where all of a sudden, it's not just about you, it's about the class and what is the class and why are we treated like this? Okay, fine, we are black. They say because we're black, but then there's this element, there's cheap labor, the, why we put in the outskirts. It starts to really conscientize people, right, militant struggle. And we see this happening. And, uh, and, 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 and as with unions and these structures, uh, you, know, you know, going about raising these larger issues, it enabled people to take more and more control over their daily lives and start to build. To build what? Well, a counter power against the government, right? Resisting the state at those local levels, the township levels, and sometimes later replacing some of its functions. The people shall govern. Literally being taken literal, right? Uh, 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 which was really, really, really exciting to see, right? Um, um, it, it must be remembered that in many townships, there was little access to electricity or water, you know, in the home. Switch systems barely existed often involved the bucket system, public toilets, etc., and there was massive housing backlogs. In this situation, women and children often played a key role in the struggle. Even non-politicized housewives were easily mobilized uh, uh, in, into the struggle for local change. Uh, one example comes from the, the Vahal Park Civil Association, which was formed by the residents of the Kala Township of Vahal Park in the Western Cape, to address these specific issues like evictions, uh, etc., The Civic reconnected water and electricity that had been cut off by the authorities and put people back in houses if they were evicted, right? So, so, so this was a real, real, real people's power organ, you know, and there are many examples like it, right? Now, you can tell that had I been given the, the time uh, uh, the month or the year, I could really keep cropping up with different examples. But I think we, we need to develop a holistic look around the stuff. So I, I really have to now zone into a couple of problems and limitations of the people's power. And, and, and I do believe that these limitations should be noted and understood and perhaps taken forward to see what we can do with that information for the future, to see how we can rebuild. Um, um, unless if you are of the mind that everything is fine uh, in South Africa right now, right? <laughs> right. So, so please do have a close read of Stimart and Bernard. I, I have made sure that that is part of your reading. Um, it's an incredible, uh, 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 you know, general academic paper. Uh, where they carefully put together, you know, the, 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 a couple of these arguments that I'm about to make, uh, uh, you know, and, and really does kind of like show us the other side, right? The other side of the people's power movement or the other side when things go wrong and why potentially things went wrong, um, um, which could actually, you know, in my humble opinion, also ex slightly explain where we are today, right? So you see in theory, the masses, right, controlled and managed these alternative structures, especially at the very beginning. But these structures developed unevenly and in different ways. And I've been very clear about that. The people's courts, for example, were the most controversial. I think, you know, uh, they are also called kangaroo courts, uh, or well, they, were, they were later known as kangaroo courts. Um, and they sometimes involved violent vigilante justice, right, and largely led by the youths. People's justice systems varied widely, and special efforts were made by the UDF and others to end abuse in people's justice, but things did go wrong, uh, 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 you know, sometimes. The People's Power Movement was also a contested space. You can imagine with, with this idea of millions mobilizing, right, a lot of people I think started to see people's power as a vehicle, as a means to an end. And this, uh, you know, third years, I, I, once again, I'm very jealous. I wish I had more time with you. Because if you really think about it, using moments of militant struggle like this as a vehicle is not new. The Marxists, they've done it before. Um, 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 the ANC 
with the South African Communist Party it targeted the state. I mean, I mean, that's kind of like what you what, what we have today, the tri-party alliance, you know, the, 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 this element of the state where the South African Communist Party, due to their own analysis, good or bad, ends up taking a back seat to the ANC, right? But they, 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 the ANC used that moment as a vehicle to get to the state and then say they were going to use the state as another vehicle to transform society. Right. I, I mean, I know I sound very critical, but what I am doing, however, is laying out, you know, different stages of how ideas transform into praxis and where praxis uh, uh, is linked to an idea or where it's not linked to an idea. You know, the end result, uh, you know, what is it that we get here? Right. So people started to view or different uh, 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 um, institutions or different groups, rather, started to view people's power right as a potential vehicle so it became a contested space where different groups tried to use it for their own purposes i remember by the sideline at the beginning of the 1980s with the pac we have the anc the the, the 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 armed wing of the anc we've got underground cells looking at, uh, at this crazy massive spontaneous explosive you know no moment, right, or, or, or people just rising up and building stuff, and 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 time and time again, everybody wants to do right by South Africa, which is to end apartheid. That's fine, but not everyone had the same strategy, and not everyone had the same end result plan. For example, I think I've shown you guys in lecture one and two that most of the time, when we talk about people's power, they were quite clear. They wanted the end of capitalism, which means they wanted socialism now, number one. They wanted the end of apartheid, which meant no racial oppression in our socialism, which we're going to get now. Okay, that's a, a, a clear idea, and we can see them building these clear structures and organs of power to achieve that. However, we got uh, the end of apartheid and started off class apartheid as a byproduct of not ending capitalism. I hope you get, I hope I'm coming across clear, you know, I hope I'm coming across clear. So I'm just showing you that sometimes these contested spaces and different groups trying to use them for their own purposes, you get a mixed match thing, right? And it's a, it's it's such a an important thing to acknowledge, right? So this event really started to affect the democratic processes that we see existed at the very beginning at those grassroots levels right we start to see how the democratic systems were and what they would achieve and what ideas they originally wanted to express and what we got right the anc and south african communist party in the 1980s wanted the struggle to be under their control and even more specifically as they recorded in their own documents time and time again under the control of the exiled anc and south african communist uh, uh, party leaders, you know, uh, uh, and that was important for them, uh, uh, and rightly so for their strategy. Right, so they also saw uh, 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 this transition in South Africa, I'm talking about the ANC and the South African Communist Party, they saw this transition in South Africa as an armed one, right, that's what they wanted, like, okay, fine, people's power, look at all these millions of people, this is something that could work well as an armed struggle. It has to be centered on MK, right? Lead into a new state, new state, controlled by the ANC and the South African Communist Party. Well, well, well. <laughs> right. I would go as far as to argue that the ANC took advantage of and exploited the masses as a strategic commodity, right? I'm happy to debate you on that if you want to debate. Debate is good in academia. We don't always have to agree, but we always have to be able to back ourselves up, I guess. Uh, um, um, but, but for me, that's kind of like where I stand on that particular issue. They did not really view people's power and alternative structures as valuable in themselves, right? But simply as part of their own militaristic strategy. The more the ANC's influence rose, the more the people shall govern actually meant the ANC shall govern. I'll say that again. The more the ANC's influence late 80s, late 80s, 86, 87, 88, etc., the more their influence rose, 
the more the people shall gab and started to mean, started to feel synonymous to the ANC shall govern, right? There, there was something happened there where there was a change, right? Now, for the ANC, uh, the organs of people's power were really a microcosmetic or a microcosm representation of the overall ANC strategy that mirrored their leadership style and their ability to be ruthless, okay? Uh, 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 um, as the people's alternative structures were now being taken over by the ANC, tasks were now being sent from top down, top down to the communities versus my yard, my block, my street committee, then goes to talk to, you know, you know, the, the, the worker committees, etc., etc. Now, everything was now flowing top down to the committees with a strong emphasis of mass mobilization continuously throughout the country, but around a different project. Some structures of the people's power were turned into wings of the ANC. I mean, we spoke about, and by the way, I thought it was very brilliant. What Matthew uh, go Goniwe achieved was absolutely incredibly brilliant um, in Craddock, right? Um, but that actually, a, a lot of those organs in Craddock became a big part of the ANC's uh, uh, wing, all right? Uh, uh, so, 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 so not all, but a lot of them, right? Turning to wings of the ANC, taking orders directly from the ANC and not from the people. Although at first, a sound as a military strategy, this led to unorganized levels of violence because they were. Now, and the ANC lost control over the violent chaos and also lost obedience from the youth that they had set loose. And this is such an interesting thing that actually takes place. An interesting, as uh, someone studying the history, but a very sad thing for the people who went through it. Because remember, if you really think about grassroots democracy, there are so many checks in place. Even from the street yard committee linked to the church committee, linked, there are so many checks and balances in place. The level of accountability there was a heavy mandate to carry, all right? But now with ANC taking over a lot of these wings, right, uh, and sending uh, instructions top down, it's very easy to see how one could lose control, especially over, you know, a national wide uh, uh, people's power movement. Uh, um, um, the plan itself uh, uh, was to control all these alternatives uh, uh, so as to outnumber strategically the government forces. And I think I explained that in lecture two, that if you just think about it logically, even in 2023, if all of us were to go out to the street today, all of us, 60 million of us, were to say enough is enough, we are protesting against electricity, all of us, not a, 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 a call from EFF, and, 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 and I talk about every single political party, I'm not affiliated with any particular party, I'm just saying, uh, uh, for example, the call from the EFF recently in 2023 for a national shutdown, and most of us didn't uh, adhere to it. The, the, that's what a top-down order looks like, versus all of us in our streets, in our residences, being uh, 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 agreeing to leave our rooms in our residences or in our homes, in our streets, at a specific time, and being organized from a bottom-up perspective, fighting for what we need in Alice, what we need in Fort Buford, what we need in Grahamstown, and those needs may not always be the same, okay? Oh, there's a big difference. So the ANC's plan was to control all these alternatives, right, so as to outnumber. If we were to all come out now today on the streets, there is not enough police and soldiers, et cetera, et cetera, to arrest us. There's not even enough government structures to put us all into prison. I'm not inciting a protest. I'm just talking strategically, right? So this strategy has long existed in the 1980s and has worked very well uh, in general. Meaning, many people's power structures were used to repress uh, you know, you know, rival currents. So the ANC started to use the you know, the wings that they controlled as well for that. This milit militaristic approach rested heavily on the unemployed youth and not the unions. And with that, within the communities, the prospects of the organs of power and of people power started to become very tainted, very, very tainted. Um, 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 and, and this 
actually became you know a, 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 an incredibly problem you know I'll never I'll never forget this quote um uh, 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 where uh, I think a mother was being interviewed and she said before it was the security police we were afraid of now it's our children right this is kind of like very wild for me man it, it really does give give a clear picture you know of the height of violence happening in the townships at that particular time and now that violence is not no longer solely focused on counter power but it's also focused against itself against your own people right now the youth were continuously spurred into action and also used against non-anc groups both in unions and the successors of the bc movement like azapo the people's power was closely associated with udf right very strong ties with udf but the udf was itself a product of a wave of struggle it was not politically homogeneous so it wasn't all united on all issues or completely 100 percent aligned with the anc rather it, and it wasn't also by the way an anc front that's not my take on the udf uh, I, and, you know, it might be worth doing one day, you know, a week on the UDF era, right? I, I think that by itself needs its own time. But where ANC populists were strong, youth structures, street committees, people's courts, and union structures were used against political opponents, right? So this opened Pandora's box, which is still yet to be closed, of violence and of intolerance, unlike a more open approach of Posatu and the early UDF. I mean, these guys had boycotts after boycotts after boycotts in the 1980s. Today, if we go protest today, right, if there was a protest today about water, somewhere along the line there's going to be looting. Somewhere along the line, I mean, I'm hoping, you know, that example alone is quite clear, right? So naturally, with such type of violence, you know, a good number, you know, well over 20,500 people were killed in political violence from 1984 uh, to about 1994. And this included victims of ANC intolerance, including and against, you know, you know, black consciousness and workerism. Years of political upbuild, you know, produced a lost generation and a blur between political activism an indiscriminate thuggery, like, like uh, uh, you know, very unfortunate there. Right now, in contrast to, say, an organization like the UDF, the UDF in South Africa took a much more positive approach to people's power. We're, we're talking about ideas and influence in these organs and describing it at the basis of a radical, democratic new South Africa. Right? It never openly came out. The UDF never openly came out supporting uh, you know, MK either. However, the UDF leadership rejected the idea that the struggle was for the destruction of capitalism. People's power said it was at the very beginning. No capitalism, no apartheid, no tyranny. Very, very clear ideas. Uh, UDF was more like, well, we like this idea of people's power and we like this radical democratic new South Africa. However, we are not entirely sure, comrades, of your analysis of the destruction of capitalism, right? Or should be, uh, 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 or, or, or whether at all everything should be really around class struggle, right? In this way, UDF kept, you know, the South African Communist Party's two-stage theory, um, I'm not entirely sure if you guys know what that is, but essentially, uh, you know, the worst, quickest, shortest version to explain the two-stage theory is basically that the ANC or the South African Communist Party, in analyzing South Africa, where South Africa is, uh, they, they use this incredible framework, very complicated stuff, but essentially in to, to, to determine whether or not South Africa was ready for socialism. People's power wants socialism now. They want capitalism to go away. But the two-stage theory says, well, before you can get to socialism, there are so many or a couple of things that need to happen in a two-stage way. First of all, the type of capitalism in South Africa at that time, 1980s, that you want it to end right now, has not fully developed to a point where when we get to socialism with this current unfully developed capitalism we might have a you know a, a, a malfunction in socialism i'm just trying to give like a very 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 quick summary 
of what this two-stage approach was. So essentially, the, the conclusion of the analysis was sort of ending capitalism, ending you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, the state completely. Why not create your own state, a black state, ANC, for example, and use that black state to quicken, right, the road to socialism, right? And and as you can see, we are still on that road, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Each to their own, though, right? So, so, so it was against, uh, and, and I'm still talking about the UDF here. The UDF was against a crude populist national uh, populist nationalism including black consciousness which it argued advocated uniting by obliterating differences uh, uh you know for example the bc is speaking of a single black consciousness and i don't know if i agree with that per se but kind of like uh, i'm just trying to paint the picture of, of the difference between how the anc mk guys viewed people's power how they wanted to use it how unions viewed it how they tried to influence it, and now how big structures like the UDF viewed it, right? And how they and what parts of it they wanted to use, uh, you know, so to speak, right? So, uh, what it argued for, what the UDF wanted to see rather, was a multi-class nationalist alliance that knew that different classes had different interests, right? But still saw them as united around the limited goal of ending apartheid but not necessarily ending capitalism. Man, ah, oh, I wish we had so much time to just, you know, just break this stuff down, guys. These are big ideas, you know. You know, this taps into the national question. It taps into all sorts of incredible things, uh, but we are, all of us, living a particular socioeconomic life as an end result of some of these ideas, right? So that's why ideas are very important, right? So, you know, to conclude, because I have to, because if I tell Ms. McQuaid that I want to make another recording for you guys, she she, she, she might herself break out into a, a protest, right? So to conclude, uh, and as I've already indicated above, right, People's Power Movement was later bullied, co-opted into nationalistic agendas of the ANC and the South African Communist Party. The South African Communist Party intoxicated with this two-stage approach overestimated its contribution to the alliance uh, with the ANC, right? And remained a junior partner. And you can't, you know, you know, you you, you can't deny that in 2023. But today, the Southern Communist Party does not exist anymore as an independent force. Uh, today, for example, the Black Conscious Movement missed its window of opportunity in the late 1970s. Although it was a major ideological framework uh, uh, you know, of the masses or for the masses, it remained in the realm of the abstract with no clear praxis. They, they did stuff, don't get me wrong, they did stuff, but here, guys, we're talking about mass projects, right? Mass mobilization projects, okay? Uh, um, um, and it was crushed anyways by the state and defeated uh, uh, by the then small ANC, which, however, had a much more effective strategy and tactics, good or bad, however you view it, right? And today we can also reflect that the workerists uh, also had an important weakness to point out to, right, the, the unions, Kosatu's in them, right, they lost control of the unions, especially when Kosatu emerged, right, and this all meant ANC managed to monopolize the Moses role, managed to, to, to make uh, uh, use of all these gaps and to quickly take on the role as the lead of the liberation struggle, uh, and, you know, eventually, you know, it is what it is, and we got what we got right now. With these developments, two big things were lost, uh, in my humble opinion. Uh, the first, the radical alternative tra trajectory uh, made possible by people's power and workers' control was closed down in favor of a nationalist, you know, status road. And, and uh, you know, my PhD's work is really to kind of like really... Uh, reinvigorate that, really look at those emancipatory trajectories, really highlight them, really, you know, you know, you know, you know, make sure that they are not a lost history, uh, 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 but really a, 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 a campus, you know, to, 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 to the way forward. Secondly, the practices of communing, the practices of struggle seen in the 1980s became secondary. Uh, to the big issues of politics today, right? Where the state is at the center of delivering services, where if there's no water, where you stay and you haven't had water for the last three months. And there are many places like that in the Eastern Cape, 
um, um, I mean, as we we stayed in, in in Makanda for almost ten years, the water crisis in Grahamstown, Makanda, is still there. Um, um, where all these issues, you find that everybody's waiting for the state to deliver. You know, versus this rich history of taking over and creating organs of power and structure. You know, in the same way, we understand why it is easy for workers to take over a factory because. They, they, it is their site of, of, of production. It's a site of production. It's pretty much the same thinking, I think, that the 1980s peoples, uh, you know, understood. We live here. This is our community. Why should they be litter in our community? Why should we not have electricity in our community? These are the problems. How do we go about fixing them in a democratic way? You know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So. Um, um, yeah, man, this is what I have uh, prepared for you guys. I really hope you've enjoyed uh, this three-part lecture series in the 1980s. Um, I had to quickly pick a couple of things to put together uh, only because I was worried about time, right? Uh, but maybe, you know, we'll meet one day again and really dive deep into this whole subject matter. I'm wishing you guys well in your studies. Uh, 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 please don't forget you read for a degree uh, anyways, reading will always improve your writing, and at some point you're going to have to write uh, 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 um, um, for your degree, so don't forget to read, right? I appreciate all of you. Take care. Goodbye.